to our conversation today. Uh, this is Mathematics for Human Flourishing, an interdisciplinary conversation. Uh, I'm Travis Pickell, and I'm the Associate Director of University Engagement at Anselm House, a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota. Today's event is the result of a partnership between Anselm House and Upper House, a Center for Christian Study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Both Anselm House and Upper House exist to serve Christian students, faculty, and staff, and to advance Christian intellectual engagement in the context of large public land-grant universities. Over the past few years, our two organizations have partnered on a number of public events and faculty uh, retreats and online forums, like the one that we're excited to host today. In his idea of the university, John Henry Newman argued that a university is, as reflected in its very name, um, is something that exists for the pur purpose of pursuing the unity of knowledge, by which he meant, I think, an integrated and holistic approach to academic inquiry. According to Newman, no field of legitimate study should be left out, and the various disciplines, as necessary as they are, must not proceed as if they're own way of approach was fully sufficient for understanding truth. Both disciplinary silos and the modern tendency to bracket out religious and specifically theological concerns have had the unfortunate side effect of obscuring knowledge, both in its entirety and in its parts. Newman envisioned the university as a place where students would benefit, quote, by living amongst those and under those who represented the whole circle of knowledge, an assemblage of learned men zealous for their own sciences and rivals of each other are brought by familiar intercourse and for the sake of intellectual peace to adjust together the claims and relations of their respective subjects of investigation, to learn to respect, to consult, and to aid each other." End quote. So today's conversation aims to be one which in the spirit of Newman's vision is demonstrated. Here we bring insights from perspectives of multiple disciplines together in a way that also attends to broader questions of meaning, purpose, and transcendence. The relationship between mathematics and human flourishing, so eloquently described by Professor Sue in his recent book on the topic, will be our focus. In conversation with Professor Sue, we're excited to have Dan Hummel, Director of University Engagement at Upper House, Dan's a historian by training, having earned his PhD in history from University of Wisconsin-Madison. His first book, which came out in 2019, was called Covenant Brothers, Evangelicals, Jews, and U.S.-Israeli Relations, it was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. And he's at work on another book on the history of dispensational theology from Erdman's Press. His writing on history has appeared in the Washington Post and the Religious News Service and um, really excited to have Dan converse with Francis Sue. So at this point, I'd like to invite Dan on, who will introduce Francis and start our conversation together. Hello, and uh, welcome to this conversation with Francis Sue. Uh, Francis Sue is the Benedictine Carwa Professor of Mathematics at Harvey Mudd College, and he's also the author of the book we're going to talk about today, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, which came out with the University of Yale Press uh, last year. And the last thing I want to mention about Francis before bringing him on screen is that he was the president of the Mathematics Association of America uh, a few years ago. And so he is one of the foremost mathematicians uh, in the country at work today. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to get into your book. Uh, I should set this up for uh, the viewers that uh, I am a historian, uh, and uh, I will sort of weigh in a few times here uh, from the historical perspective, but I also want to try to represent a few other fields as well, um, art and sociology and, and a couple other ones. Um, but what I found so enriching about your book and uh, what I think will be really productive today is um, to just think about the very universal human desires and virtues that you talk about in your book from multiple perspectives. And um, I, as I mentioned, I'll bring some of that, but I also want to encourage viewers to use the chat 
function to um, ask questions yourself. We had a number of pre-submitted questions, and we'll get to those at, at the uh, second half of our time here. But also would be uh, very interested in people's live reactions and questions uh, from multiple perspectives. So uh, please use that chat function, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So with that said, Francis, could you just set us up uh, and, and give us a synopsis of Mathematics for Human Flourishing and a little about why you wrote the book? Sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I guess one way you can think of my book is that it's a, a plea to change the way that we view ourselves by changing how we view mathematics. Uh, viewing math not just as a collection of facts to learn, but as a set of practices that shape us and practices that connect to our deep human longings. Uh, and I, I attempt to do that in the book by telling lots of stories, uh, including my own, but also uh, that of uh, uh, Simone Weil, who's a, some of you may know as a French religious um, philosopher, uh, and Christopher Jackson, uh, an incarcerated man uh, who is uh, also a friend uh, and uh, who discovered a, a passion for math uh, while in prison. And I, I wrote the book because so many people, including myself, uh, have had bad experiences in mathematics. I tell some of those stories uh, from my own experience in, uh, in the book. Uh, and, but yet, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones who, who see a side of math that few people get to see, uh, the creative side, the life-affirming side, uh, the enchanting side of mathematics. And uh, I think more people should see that side, and, and yet that's not, not often how it's taught. And, um, I'm, I'm drawn to questions of the soul uh, and uh, the kind of questions that I know you like to explore here at Upper House. And, uh, and I've uh, often asked myself how math connects to the human soul. And, and the book is really a result of me uh, exploring that question. Great, thanks. And, and just to give uh, viewers, if you haven't picked up the book, a sense, it's, it's in 13 chapters and each chapter is titled um, what you call a human desire. Uh, and so uh, some of them are flourishing and exploration and meaning. Um, and, and we'll be sort of talking about uh, a few of those. And, there, and there's a number of more. Actually, I'll just, I'll just list the rest. Flourishing, exploration, meaning, play, beauty, permanence, truth, struggle, power, justice, freedom, community, and love. And so you can get a sense even from those, those words sort of how... Uh, universal and how how broad ranging um, this discussion can go. Uh, th those are those are topics. Those are desires, as you say, that um, uh, touch every human uh, and and sort of unite us maybe uh, as humans. Uh, before getting into the 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 sort of content of the book, could you say a little more about your co? I mean, he's listed as a co-author, Christopher Jackson, um, and and what he brought to the project, and and even in in the book, how you. Um, how you how you bring in his letters as well? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Chris uh, Chris's story is a, a redemption story. That's uh, basically uh, the the framing uh, of the book is that here is a, a story of a fellow who discovered math in prison, uh, and as his his life uh, is being in, in some sense uh, redeemed because of the, the 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 things that he's the ways he's growing and, and learning. Um, and, and there are many redemption stories in the book, but his is perhaps the most prominent. And uh, he and I have corresponded for many years now. Uh, he's supplied letters from our correspondence that appear in between uh, the chapters. Uh, and as you move forward through the book, you see his transformation uh, over time through these letters. And it's, uh, it's really uh, remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, every, I, I think at the end of every chapter, there's a, there's a letter by Chris and then like a brain teaser math question. So it's a fun thing to, uh, it's sort of, there's a rhythm to, to the chapters in, in that way as well. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say one of, the, one of the things that, I mean, I, he and I correspond over uh, many things. Uh, you talk about uh, math, but we also talk about life and other things. But uh, as I was writing the book, uh, I sent him drafts of the chapters. And so some of the letters you see are kind of responses to ideas that appeared in the chapter. And then at some point I said, well, gosh, you know, like, I, I think your letters actually capture a lot of, mm. of, uh, of um, the, the kinds of things that, we, that I want to communicate in the book. And so that's when um, we invited him on as, a, as an official contributor to the book. And, he, uh, uh, it, it, and so all these letters are actually candid letters, right? He didn't know they were going to be uh, in, uh, in 
uh, a book when he was writing them. And so you sort of see a, a real, a real honest uh, reflection of, of him uh, through these letters. Yeah, that's fascinating. A very unique wrinkle to the book. Uh, sort of sets it apart from from other books in the same genre for sure. Um, so before getting into the details of the chapters, I think it, it'd be helpful just to give you a chance to define some terms. And so um, what do you mean by mathematics um, and what do you mean by human flourishing? I know those are really big concepts, but do you have some sort of working definitions for us? Yeah, I'll try to be, yeah, I'll try to be as brief as possible. So um, it's often among mathematicians common to speak of mathematics as uh, the science of patterns. Uh, and that, you know, one that's is that it shows what it is that mathematicians do. We like looking at patterns, not just numerical patterns, but maybe patterns in, you know, in nature, patterns in uh, the kinds of things that underlie, you know, the things around us. Um, but I, I, I like to add something to that description. I like to talk about math not just as a science, but as an art, the art mm -hmm. of engaging the meaning of those patterns. So that's probably the, the quickest way I, I, I describe math. The science of patterns and the art of engaging the meaning of, of patterns. Uh, and I like to think of human flourishing as uh, living life well, even in the most difficult circumstances. Uh, and perhaps it's, it's most tightly bound um, for this audience to a, a Christian conception of, of joy, something that's deeper and, and more um, uh, uh, not... Uh, not just uh, an idea of happiness, it's not just a state of mind, but the idea that you are um, uh, both being and doing, you're, you're, you're uh, uh, learning to live life well and you're helping others to do the same. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I'm a historian. I really enjoyed reading the book as a historian, uh, mostly for two reasons. One was to think about what a, a history for human flourishing would, would look like, sort of, um, uh, I think a lot of people can read your book and sort of read in their own disciplinary background and think, oh, these, con you know, something like beauty. What would a historian say about beauty? Um, so that was one way. Uh, and, and another way, though, was to think um, about what you were actually saying about math and thinking about how historians, uh, how, how, how the historical discipline uh, can intersect with that or how other disciplines can intersect with that, those insights and how those insights might be expressed differently in a different field but I actually are, are getting at some truth. So um, that's sort of how I want to um, approach uh, sort of throwing in my own uh, comments here is, is just as a way to stir the pot and, and maybe um, uh, help us sort of have a, a, a wide conversation about uh, some of the, the chapter titles and some of the human desires um, that we're talking about. So I thought the first one we could go to is exploration, which is one of your early um, chapters. And I wanted to read just a very short passage uh, from the book that um, gets at maybe one of the stereotypes that, um, that outsiders might have of math. Um, and this is on page 23. And you say, um, exploration and understanding are at the heart of what it means to do mathematics. Unfortunately, exploration is not a word one associates with mathematics if one thinks it is just arithmetic or something advanced and even more dreary that was discovered and settled long ago. Um, and so there you're trying to push back against a very popular conception maybe of, of math as, as sort of rote memorization or something like that. So can you give us a sense of how you understand exploration being at the center of math? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I think of exploration as, as beginning with a question, uh, what if, right? If, if you go on a hike, you might ask, what if I take this path instead of that one? Uh, and it's the same way in math, right? When somebody teaches me an idea, I naturally ask, what else can I learn from this idea? Uh, and so I, I give you an example. Um, uh, my PhD advisor is famous for uh, uh, studying the question, how long does it take to mix a deck of cards when you shuffle a deck? And you know, that's a question that, you know, that, that intersects the things we do every day, like play with a deck of cards. Uh, and uh, his, the question he asked was, well, how many shuffles, if you take a riffle shuffle and you shuffle the deck the way people, people normally do, they, they sort of interleave the deck uh, uh, using a riffle, um, uh, riffling uh, the deck, uh, then you could ask, like, how, how many shuffles does it take to mix the deck? Like, is the deck well mixed after one or two shuffles? And 
Uh, most people, if, if you think about this a little bit and you just study the cards, you realize the answer is no, not, not two shuffles. And, and so here's a question that had not been answered uh, until only recently, until he actually settled the question that it takes seven shovels to mix a deck of cards. So that's a, that's a, a mathematical idea. It sort of shows that math is alive. Uh, and it's not just a bunch of things that was that were discovered, you know, centuries ago and settled uh, centuries ago. We we still have open questions in mathematics. And uh, the other thing that's interesting here is that once you ask that question, it leads to lots of other questions, right? You uh, you might ask, well, gosh, what about other kinds of shuffling, right? If I mix a deck using an overhand shuffle, which is another popular way of shuffling a deck of cards, uh, is that better or worse? Uh, and it, it turns out it's a lot worse. And uh, and that this, this is a question that's only been settled relatively recently. And, I, and I'm talking, you know, like you know, the last like 30 years. And uh, in geologic time, it's it's very recent. <laughs> in, in human history, it's very recent, right? Uh, and so this is what exploration is, right? It, if I if I uh, if I show you a new way to multiply numbers in your head, uh, then when you learn that, you're not just satisfied with learning that fact, right? You're like, well, gosh, what if I want to do something else? And I, I could tell you a, I could actually, let's do this. I'll, I'll tell you a trick uh, for multiplying uh, a two-digit number by eleven in your head quickly. Do you want? Do you want to see? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, give me a two-digit number. Uh, twenty-two. No, that maybe okay, that's too hard. No, 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 no. It's fine. Okay. So I'm going to multiply twenty-two by eleven. And it turns out there's a very nice pattern. Uh, you just take the two digits and you add them together and you put that number in between. So two and two, two plus two is four. We'll put the four in between. The so 22 times 11 is 242. Okay, so that's that's a cool, you know, it's a cool pattern. It's interesting. Yeah. But, you know, somebody who's mathematically trained would ask, why is that pattern whole? And, and does it work for other numbers? Like what happens if you give me another two digit number like 35? Mm. Sure enough, if you do 35 times 11, you'll realize it's 385. You're like, oh, okay, this pattern holds. Why does this pattern hold? And, and so the explorer side would say, gosh, uh, if, what if I want to multiply a three digit number by, by 11? What, what's the pattern? Uh, or if I want to multiply two digit number by 111, is there a similar mm. pattern? Mm. This is the kind of thing that Explorer engages in. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, uh, I, I that you talking about uh, cards, uh, reminded me of one of the just sort of facts in, in your book, um, uh, about how many, how many potential combinations there are in a 52 card deck. Um, and how that number is it more than the stars in the universe, uh, more than really, ba basically the takeaway I had was like every single time anyone ever shuffles a deck, it's probably a unique uh, 52 card arrangement. And that's just, there, there's something oddly inspiring about that, uh, that, that sort of every, yeah. every casino hall has, you know, <laughs> unique, uh, unique uh, uh, yeah. shuffling every time. It's mind blowing. Right? Yeah, 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 it is. And so yeah. It's, that actually points out another thing about math is uh, it's sort of meaningless unless you, you place it in context in some way, right? We could right. talk about the very large number, you know, the 10 to 68 uh, uh, combinations, uh, yeah. but that, that has no meaning unless you place it in some kind of context, like, whoa, you know, like that's so large that, uh, you know, anytime you, you shuffle a deck of cards, you're making history, right? Like that's the first <laughs> time that that deck configuration has ever been seen most likely right right yeah exactly well thanks francis uh thinking about um this stereotype though of math it made me think about um how history is often understood by outsiders uh that some might define it as just a a sort of chronicling of facts um of just arranging names and dates and um, and it made sort of thinking through this reminded me of a of a famous historian named E. H. Carr from the 20th century who wrote a book called What Is History. It was from the 1960s, where he was trying to do some of the public uh, relations work that you're doing with with math. And he had this line that that I think you could you could fit in historians or uh, uh, mathematicians as well. Uh, this is E. H. Carr. He said, "To praise a historian for his accuracy is like praising an architect for using well seasoned timber." or properly mixed concrete in his building. And we might say a mathematician using her multiplication tables or something like that. 
And he says, it is, it is a necessary condition of his work, but not his essential function. And that's, of course, the underlying a lot of disciplines is there is, a, there is of course, a basic um, a craft, a basic need for, for that sometimes memorization, but, but other times just mastery of very basic skills. But that is in order to get to um, much uh, deeper truths or, or in another way to think about this, at least historians talk about sort of the difference between historical knowledge and historical understanding. And, and that knowledge it can, you can accumulate a lot of knowledge and not have a lot of understanding um, of, of, or appreciation of the knowledge. Um, so, I mean, you've talked about it a little, but do you have anything else to say about sort of the relationship between the facts of math and the open yeah. exploration of math. And I think you just had a great example there, but how might, you know, how might you say that to non-mathematicians? Yeah, I mean, I love the example that you brought up. I mean, I think this points out that there's a tendency in many subjects to be reductionist, uh, isn't there, right? History isn't just a bunch of facts. Uh, language uh, acquisition isn't just about grammar, right? right? Chemistry is not just about memorizing a periodic table, right? You know, and, and uh, as a historian, uh, your exploration might lead you to ask, what, what trends in history can I uncover, right? Uh, in ex uh, language, uh, uh, exploration might lead you to write poetry, right. right? And in chemistry, you might ask, what novel molecules can uh, we build uh, and what can we do with them, right? right. And so, you know, one of the, the best ways that, that we can, all of us, not just mathematicians, can can encounter this aspect of math, I think, is is uh, in everyday things you're doing, like uh, playing games of strategy, right? Each time you play a game, you're engaging in strategic thinking. You have to ask, if I do this, then what's going to happen? Uh, or, or maybe learning to appreciate puzzles. This is another, um, another way that you can bring this exploration side into, into the way we, we do math and think about math. That's great. Yeah, so let's turn to another of your chapters, beauty. Uh, and beauty is something we often associate with the discipline of art. And in fact, it, you make that connection right off the bat in the chapter where you quote Olga Towski Todd, who says, uh, the yearning for and the satisfaction gained from mathematical insight brings the subject near to art. And so right there, that's that connection between math um, and art and, and beauty. Um, and I wonder if that connection might be counterintuitive to some people. Um, and, and just one really um, simple and spatial metaphor of that is here at UW. The building that houses the art department is quite far away from the building that houses the math department. And um, they, there are many buildings in between, including the humanities building and, the, uh, and an administration building and the, the music school building. Um, and that might be just a, a spatial metaphor of, of some of the distance that um, might, people might have to make to connect math to beauty. So how should we think about this connection between math and beauty? Uh, and you talk particularly about uh, types of beauty. You talk about sensory beauty and wondrous beauty, insightful beauty, and transcendent beauty. So I don't, you don't have to pick up all of those, but um, those are the different ways you're talking about beauty. How do you see that connection working out? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I have. Uh, I, I thought you might ask about these. I have some slides here that I'm going to uh, share that uh, might help uh, illuminate what I what I mean when I think about beauty. Yeah. Well, one of the things that often happens when you encounter something beautiful is uh, you you stop and you reflect. Right. That's the uh, like this picture, um, which is uh, from my book. Um, uh, is a picture of a figure that is standing before a mathematical pattern and just stopping to reflect. That's that's what I mean by uh, sensory beauty. Uh, it's just uh, the the uh, idea that we, um, uh, you know, that we we stop and ask, "Hey, what's going on? Why is this thing striking me the way that it's striking me?" Uh, but then, you know, you might move yeah. on from there to begin to ask questions like. Um, why is this, uh, Francis, could you share what's your screen? going on in this map? Oh yeah. Did I not share the screen? Let me see. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a, it says here that I, I am sharing the screen. So I wonder okay. if that's a issue with, uh, is, is Dan, uh, is, uh, someone in the background able to put the screen share up? 
I'll stop sharing. I'll try sharing again. Okay, sounds good. It's all right if we don't if we don't have a if it doesn't end up being possible to share. It, there, I've, I've shared it. Go. So let's see. Ah, here we go. Okay, yeah. So Sorry here's for interrupting a, you. A, a figure. From, yeah. No, no problem. This is yeah. a figure from my book. Uh, yeah. A figure standing for a mathematical uh, 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 pattern. In this case, it looks like stained glass windows, and that was intentional, right? So there's a there's a, this sense of awe at the mystery of a beauty. Uh, and the same thing happens in mathematical beauty as well. You you have a sense of awe. So uh, um, here's another um, uh, potential uh, example. Um, let me see here. My computer is is being finicky right now. I wonder. Oh, actually, you. I think I unshared the screen. That's part of the problem. Play slideshow window. Try that again. Okay, so I think you can still see this here. And then not. Hang on. Play slash window. Sorry, I had to go. It was because I was going the wrong direction. Uh, here are some other patterns uh, that uh, evoke a sense of, of mystery and awe. Uh, if uh, if we the screen share here. Oh, the share screen is off. Hang on, let me try again. Here we go. Uh, a couple of other um, of uh, other patterns uh, to look at here. Um, so uh, one of the things that often happens is you you notice a pattern and then you appreciate it for like you know there's sort of some insight that happens and this is kind of the, the feeling like uh, of insightful beauties when you sort of see whoa something amazing I just noticed something. So uh, in the upper right corner here you see the square uh, and. Um, if you see the the colors of the stripes of different colors, you see that um, basically we have a square that's composed of a bunch of stripes, and the stripes have one, three, five, seven, and nine squares in them. And so, what does this picture represent? It actually shows you why, if you sum up odd numbers, you always get a square number, right? One plus three plus five squares is a three by three. A box, so it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be three square. But one plus three plus five plus seven plus nine is five square. And, and once you see this pattern, you're like, oh, hey, I I sort of understand why it is that when I add up a bunch of odd numbers, I get a square number. That's mm -hmm. kind of like the awe, the wonder, the the insightful beauty that you get from a mathematical idea. Mm -hmm. um, in the bottom left, there's a picture of. Uh, of uh, a, a representation of why it is that the fundamental uh, that the um, Pythagorean theorem is true. Some of us remember this from high school geometry that if you have a right triangle and you add the if you look at the side lengths, um, the side lengths uh, their squares sum to the square of the hypotenuse, the long side. And and so this picture actually represents that in and helps you see why it's true. Like many of us sort of learn that and think, oh, did somebody just make that up? Did somebody just say, declare that that's true? And the answer is no, no, it's built into the fabric of how the universe works, right? Like it has to be true, right? And and so this picture shows you why it's true because the if you look at the two squares, the same size, uh, and so you have to, and then if you look at the the, the triangles, there the four triangles in each picture are also the same area. Mm. So the the blue area has to be the same as the sum of the two green areas. And if you think a little bit about it, the small square is, if you like, the one, one side length uh, of, of the triangle squared. Uh, the big, bigger uh, uh, rectangle is the other uh, side length squared. And the blue uh, uh, square is the hypotenuse squared. And so then you're like, ah, okay, I see why this is true. That's kind of the what happens with the of insightful beauty is you're like, oh, I see, I see, I understand. And so maybe um, this points to what I like to call a transcendent beauty, which is the idea that like that when you see a bunch of different, uh, I, the same idea pop up in many different places, you begin to think um, you're accessing something fundamental about the nature of the universe. That's the transcendent feeling that people get. Yeah. 
That's great. Thanks for sharing those, Francis. I, I just, I reflect on, on a difference here with, um, with history and math that, um, it seems like with, with math, um, there's just, if you can grasp a certain number of basic concepts, you can start playing in a way with, um, with sort of universal laws and, and sort of uncovering them. And, and, um, and it's a little different than math, than history, uh, for sure. In the sense that history is often driven by sort of archival research that you don't know what you're going to find until you go find it. And then, and then some of that work of that integrative work happens, but it, it is a different process. And, uh, thanks for walking us through some of that. That's actually one thing the book does very well. A number of the chapters, uh, there's a lot of images for one thing, but but there's also a lot of walking through some of these um, ways where, and you get you give us all the tools we need as we're reading to sort of grasp at least the the significance of what you're showing, and and um, and that's particularly true in the beauty chapter. Um, so here right. I just want to take a quick break and do a sort of quick questions, uh, fun little uh, rapid round with Francis, um, just to break it up before we do a couple more uh, chapters and then, um, and then get some audience questions as well. So Francis doesn't know these questions. They are, they're supposed to be fun, nothing, nothing uh, just sort of say the first thing that comes to mind, I guess. Don't, you don't need to sweat over the answers here. Um, but this also will hopefully help round, uh, round you out as an author and, and, and as a person. Um, so, so first one, do you have a favorite piece of pop culture? Uh, favorite piece of pop culture. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how about, uh, Lord of the Rings? Okay. <laughs> that's a, that's a tried and true one for sure. Uh, what's your favorite class to teach at, at Harvey Mudd? Uh, I love teaching multivariable calculus, uh, because, uh, you get to, to play with, um, uh, with, uh, drawing lots of, of pretty pictures in, in three dimensions. For those of us who don't um, know even what multivariate calculus is, is that like an advanced class? Is that an intro class? Is it somewhere in the middle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, good. So, like, for instance, uh, as late in high school or early in college, multivariable calculus is... Uh, sort of the next step up where you uh, look at change in three dimensions. It's often um, at the, the near the, 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 the set of intro courses you would take if you went on in engineering or in mathematics or in physics. Um, uh, at the upper division level, one class I love teaching is this, this class called topology, which is the study of shapes. Uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, there's hardly any numbers in it at all. It's basically thinking about... Um, uh, stretching, deforming uh, shapes, and so that's also another uh, uh, one, one I like because you 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 play with a lot of pretty pictures. Yeah, <laughs> fascinating. Um, okay, this one may may uh, resonate differently with different disciplines, but is there a in the last fifty years? Um, what's the sort of most significant paper in math that's come out? Like, has there been sort of a defining? Um, paper in your field or in, in history would be a book usually. Um, you, most of the big contributions come in book form, but um, is there something sort of pre and post that, that mathematicians in 2021 talk about? Yeah, um, well, it, it, a lot of it really depends on the, the, the sub area of math that yeah. you're in, but I guess um, some would point to um, the proof of uh, Fermat's last theorem which is this uh, question um, about numbers that uh, remained unsettled for more than 400 years. Hmm. Uh, and uh, that's often lauded as, uh, as a, a huge uh, historic achievement. Yeah, that's one thing. Uh, you mentioned a few in the book, uh, just how um, you know, really, really long questions, questions that have been around a very long time, are still being answered for the first time in the 21st century, which is... Um, maybe, maybe that's another sort of misconception is that we know all the math and, and now we're just sort of, um, passing it down, uh, generation to generation. There's a lot of new, well, part yeah, of it is definitely yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um, uh, is there an up and coming mathematician that, uh, I mean, maybe this is in, I was looking at the Mathematic Association of America, um, 
uh, uh, website and and just looking at sort of the books, your book won the, the Euler Prize for, for last year and looking at some of the other books, which are more in the sort of popularization of or math for the public type uh, domain. Is there a younger mathematician that's really doing good work in that space that, that you'd highlight? Yeah, um, I, I think my internet connection uh, cut off when you said, is there an up-and-coming mathematician that blank? So if you could fill, it, fill in the second part. I sure, just is there, a, is there an up-and-coming mathematician that's doing good work sort of uh, translating math for the public like you do? Oh, um, uh, I guess one name mine's uh, e Eugenia Chang. Mm -hmm. She's written lots of books that are related to um, helping the, uh, the public understand what math is. Great, great. Uh, in a, in a uh, maybe or two. Uh, another one that's maybe not up and coming is Jordan Illenberg, um, but uh, he's mm -hmm. written a, a book about mathematical thinking. Great, thanks for that. And, and last question uh, on, this, on this rapid round. What would you give the your what what advice would you give to an undergrad student who comes to your office and is considering majoring in in math? Do you have any sort of uh, tried and true advice you give for weighing should I major in math or not? Oh yeah, I think anybody who has a desire to to, to major in math should do it, and often do it um, with uh, in conjunction with another major uh, because especially if it's a scientific major, because there's often a lot of math uh, that you'll have to take anyways, and they can sort of double duty. But yeah, I encourage anybody to who, who's interested to, to do it and, and to not be uh, afraid of um, or be intimidated by uh, either the mathematics or the people in it. Because uh, as I say a lot in the book, a lot of what math is is learning how to struggle with hard problems and not necessarily about getting uh, answers. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, let's let's jump back in just to a couple more of the chapters. Um, I should remind uh, audience members, if you have any questions um, that has been provoked uh, by what we've talked about so far or um, as we're talking, please leave them in the chat. I see a few people have already uh, started to do that. Uh, I wanted to move to maybe one of the more unexpected chapter titles, at least for me, coming in as a non-mathematician, which is community. Um, you have beautiful reflections in that chapter on what it means to do math in community and also related to a few of the other chapters sort of around it about um, how that community can be hard to get into and how there's a hierarchy to the community uh, and how you are, sort of have a passion to um, widen that community as much as possible. So uh, can you tell us what you mean by a mathematical community? And then uh, we'll jump into a few uh, other things around that. But what's your working definition of community and how do you understand sort of math in relation to community? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, math, uh, when I think about community, I think about people gathering together over something, some mathematical uh, activity, for instance. It could be whether it's uh, doing a, uh, uh, playing a game, that's one, one uh, way to engage in mathematical community. Uh, but it could also mean, you know, doing research together at the higher, higher levels. Uh, uh, and, and so anytime we, we share an interest in some idea, a uh, mathematical idea, that's, that's sort of creating a, a community. Yeah. Uh, and, and so can you talk a little about, um, uh, I know this is sort of a, a newer sort of front on, on math, but talk about sort of, um, I think what you call at one point math justice, but also the ways that math has historically been um, segmented off from certain parts of society and, and, and sort of culturally um, more adaptable to other parts of society and how uh, particularly mathematicians today are thinking about those issues and addressing them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think people often have this view of mathematics that it is something that only some people do. Uh, and that I think uh, is a very a harmful idea, uh, first of all, because all of us are mathematical thinkers uh, and uh, we do math all the time without perhaps realizing that we're doing it. Uh, and uh, also because of the idea that, you know, a lot of the, 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 the new technologies that are shaping the way that we live are mathematical. And, um, and uh, it, it, when you are uh, limiting others from experiencing mathematical wonder and joy, or when you limit yourself, or maybe you encounter obstacles that other people placed in your path, um, you're, you're actually, uh, in some sense, uh, are 
being harmed because uh, you're not able to to uh, participate in um, uh, some of the things that actually help people flourish uh, today. Uh, and so this is you know, part of the argument of the book is broadening the purpose of why we do math, right? Math isn't just to, for me to get a credential. It's not just to get a career, to be in a career. It's not just to get a good job. Uh, and uh, But it's actually to help people flourish, which means appreciating the, 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 the uh, Seeing life differently, seeing life, seeing oneself differently, being able to uh, to see the unseen. That's one way I often talk about mathematics. It's seeing the unseen patterns of the world. Uh, and uh, we would all do better if we could if we could help one another um, do that. And so, you know, for the professional mathematician, it's often like a mark of privilege to be able to say, I have a PhD in math. Listen to me. I'm, you know, I'm wonderful. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it, there's maybe a barrier often that people who do math well uh, often see it as a, a way to um, distinguish themselves, right? There's a certain elitism. Uh, and I, I want us to sort of move away from that because I'd like all of us to be able to experience the, the, uh, the benefits of mathematics uh, and its, uh, its power to help people flourish. Yeah. Yeah, and I just think about, too, how um, there's so many ways that we probably don't even, we might think about them, but that, that you can engage in math and even in community, you know, down to Sudoku puzzles and other things that are really actually exercising um, mathematical thinking and, and skills. And so there, there's a lot of, if you sort of open your eyes to it, there's a lot of accessibility into realizing how, how many ways mathematical thinking actually intersects with most people's lives on a, on a daily basis. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's turn to uh, truth. Um, and in your chapter on truth, you delineate some of the virtues that mathematics at its best instills in the people who are searching for truth uh, through math. You talk about the thirst for deep knowledge, thinking for oneself, circumspection, intellectual humility, uh, and others. So if you can just walk us through part of that chapter, how do you see these virtues embodied in mathematical truth? And how do you see them extending sort of uh, more universally? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that in, in many ways was one of the hardest chapters to write, um, partly because of our own uh, uh, cultural and political uh, moment. Uh, be, be, and we see, of course, a lot of uh, propagated, um, uh, perhaps unwittingly, uh, by uh, people who aren't, bothering to think for themselves, right? Like there's sort of the um, the sense that uh, often we just take truth on authority. And if it's somebody I trust, then I'll, I believe it's true. Uh, and, you know, math is very different, right? Like, you know, when I see uh, a, 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 a statement like the Pythagorean theorem, uh, as a mathematical thinker, I don't just say, I, well, somebody just said it was true. Uh, it, it's not just some invention that somebody made. This is actually fundamental to the fabric of the way things work in the universe, mm -hmm. right? And and so part of what happens as a mathematical thinker, if you are thinking, uh, learning to, to to reason and think, is you want to understand every truth for yourself, uh, and that's really freeing in many ways. It it enables us to actually to say, okay, well, um, maybe you know, uh, uh, if I see um, uh, some, some, you know, idea out in the world, uh, uh, it helps me evaluate, okay, well, how does this connect to the things I already know, right? Like if I learn, uh, about gravity waves, uh, it makes me think, well, how does this connect to the high school geometry that I learned, right? Like somehow, um, this beautiful idea that somehow you can study black holes that collided, you know, millions and billions of years ago using, the geometry of the universe is kind of profound and amazing. That's like one of the biggest ideas in physics and astronomy in the last century, the, the ability uh, that, that we could do this, right? And that's all mathematical, right? You, you have some way of appreciating that. But it also allows us to say, hey, you know, like if uh, we have a pandemic that's spreading, uh, if you're mathematically trained, you begin to, to, to realize, yeah, you know, this, this thing can actually take off with exponential growth. Uh, and people, uh, it's going to be a lot more dangerous before you realize that it is dangerous um, because of exponential growth, right? So there's this, this ability that in its best forms, mathematics trains us to, to uh, not just take things on authority, but to think for ourselves. And that's, 
that's part of what I, I sort of have to unpack in a chapter. Yeah. And may, maybe it's complicated also by the, fact that, you know, I don't know if people, you know, believe it in objective truth. Yeah. And certainly there are, you know, and I, I try to nuance that discussion a little bit, um, yeah. as you maybe saw in the book. Like I, I don't, I don't, um, I have a very simple definition of truth, and I also realize that truth can be complex and there are many sides. And, and part of what I'm saying in the book is we, as mathematical thinkers, get trained to look at multiple sides of an argument. Yeah, that's great. And, and that actually, so one of the, the quotes from your book that stuck out to me was on uh, page 112. And you talk about it's a very optimistic chapter, the, the truth chapter, I think, even though it's framed in sort of a, uh, th there are challenges to this, particularly uh, in the 21st century, but um, you talk about the noble hope that we can know the whole truth, even of messy, messy, complex truths, and that some things are absolutely fundamentally true, so that we can have confidence in truth to combat those who wield lies brazenly. Um, and it reminded me, going back to my historian roots, of a, of a pretty well-known book, um, particularly among American historians, um, called That Noble Dream. So that, that's one thing that, that rang the bell, was you talk about noble hope. This book was called That Noble Dream, The Objectivity Question, and the American Historical Profession. It's from the 1980s. It's by a historian named Peter Novick, who, who is no longer with us. But that's a history of the idea of objective truth in the field of American history. Um, over the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and he ends that book in the 1980s with a chapter called There is No King in Israel, which is a reference to the book of Judges and the idea that basically um, th that the, the dream of that noble dream of, of objectivity had sort of fallen apart in the historical profession. Um, and, and, uh, and for a variety of reasons, and it, it, the, the conclusion wasn't that there is no such thing as truth, it was a more of a critique of the idea of objective truth. Um, and I think that type of, of complicating the understanding of truth has happened in a lot of fields in the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, I wonder, just give us an insight, is there a similar type of conversation in, in mathematics or has that type of, um, and I'm, I'm giving you sort of the surface level version of, of the story in, in math, and there's a variety of reasons why people question objectivity, some of them actually very good uh, reasons, but I'm wondering just if that same type of conversation is happening in mathematics, or if that's um, or if that's sort of not really part of the the mix. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, there there is a, a conversation that's going on in math uh, these days as well around that, and and that's I think the idea of uh, the objective math uh, and. Uh, Often, I, I think it's very easy for people to understand the nature of that question. So when people say that um, um, objective, they're not saying that uh, that uh, you know if I add to you know five plus five, I'm not going to get ten. I think what they're uh, trying to uh, emphasize is that because mathematics is embedded in culture, uh, often the way that we understand and interpret mathematics is is laced with um is is sort of in, intertwined with uh, inextric inextric inextricably with the culture that um that we we have around um how we do mathematics uh, and so um uh, uh one of the ways that you might uh be concerned about um, the way math is sometimes used. It's often used to, to beat people over the head, right? Like to mm -hmm. be able to say, hey, you know, like um, uh, the, the numbers just show this or that, right? Without actually thinking about the people behind those numbers uh, and without actually uh, questioning some of the assumptions that you come with when you start um, uh, uh, trying to objectify everything using mathematical um, uh, language. Uh, and so there's that. You know, on the other hand, of course, um, you know, no one's questioning the fact that, like, it's somehow wonderful, beautiful, and amazing that, you know, culture, different cultures over the centuries have rediscovered the Pythagorean theorem, right? Like, that's, that, again, that sort of points to the universal nature of certain kinds of mathematical uh, truths. So there, there is kind of this interplay that in, in conversation that's going on in math, and uh, that's often, I think, misunderstood right now by, by people who want to... Um, uh, who are, uh, are maybe not clued into that conversation. 
Yeah, makes total sense. Okay, let's let's end on your um, your last uh, desire that you discussed, which is love. Um, and I can recall in C.S. Lewis, Lewis's book, The Four Loves, how he talks about uh, agape love as sort of the the um, as unconditional love, as best expressed through. Uh, Christ's love uh, for humanity and his sacrifice. And you talk in your chapter about unconditional love as well. So I just wanted to give you the space here to talk about um, the importance of love when thinking about mathematics and uh, how do you see math as an entryway into love? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's perhaps uh, maybe most surprising chapter title in the book. I think some people are surprised to see that. But um, if you if you think a bit about how it is that we love people, uh, what does that mean? Uh, it it you know it means in, in some ways seeing um, uh, the 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 best uh, possibilities in people, uh, and uh, and so the, this chapter is really not talking about the love of math, which is often what you might think if you're just scanning the title. We're not talking about loving math. I'm actually talking about loving people. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, looking at people uh, with different eyes, right? So some of a, um, the quote that I like to pull out in the book is that every being cries out silently to be read differently. And she means to be judged differently. And, and, uh, and in, in many ways, this is what, what happens with people in math is what they're discouraged from doing math because others don't believe that they have mathematical potential. We say some people are math people and other people aren't. Uh, and uh, that tends to um, marginalize and exclude people who might otherwise uh, be actually uh, enjoy doing math and, and be, be good at it, right? So um, part of what it means to love people is actually to believe that everybody is worthy of the beauty and joy that come from understanding. That's really what that chapter is about. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And that, that's a great, um, you actually end with an epilogue that brings, uh, Chris back into the story, but, uh, it was a very interesting way to, to end the, um, end the book. Actually, this just came to me. Did you organize the chapters it, with any particular, uh, logic behind it? Um, or, or yeah, I'm sure you did. I, I'm going to assume, but what, what was it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so, some of it was so I knew I wanted to start with exploration because that's sort of fundamental uh, through it, the idea through that runs throughout the rest of the book in framing who we are uh, as explorers. Uh, and I knew I needed to end with love because it's it's perhaps the most surprising uh, and uh, challenging um, uh, chapter. Uh, and uh, it wasn't an accident that, the, that love was the 13th chapter uh, in the book. Uh, and then I needed a bunch of other chapters, you know, figure out how to organize the other chapters. And some people have asked, like, are there chapters you left out? And the answer is yes. There are actually many ideas that I thought could be chapters, and I, I didn't put them in. Hmm. Um, I think the way you see the progression is that the, the first chapters are, um, like, you know, about beauty and truth. These are probably uh, chapter ideas that, most people would, in mathematics, would not question as uh, as mathematical um, things, passions, desires that drew people to math. Um, the later chapters get into some of the more difficult um, questions related to mathematics and, and mathematical culture. And it's really a call to um, change the way math is being practiced these days. Yeah. And so that's, um, you start with some of the, the easier stuff and you move to some of the harder stuff. That was That was part of the progression. Yeah, that makes total sense. Sort of uh, shared common ground, and then moving into your yeah your your specific uh, yeah concerns. That makes total sense. Well, thanks, Francis, for the conversation so far. I want to turn to asking some uh, pre-submitted questions. I'm going to scroll through the chat here too and see what what people are asking. Um, but uh, these are some of the questions that came uh, early on uh, when people were registering. Um, and so Eric asks, uh, what have been some of the most effective ways of imparting to your students a desire to, uh, and desire and motivation to learn mathematics? So what are some of the most effective ways you've imparted to students your love of math? Yeah. Uh, often in, in lower division courses um, where I, I encounter lots of students who are taking math because it's a requirement, uh, 
and not necessarily there because they, they've seen the wonder and the, the beauty of mathematical thinking. I like to start off uh, my classes just uh, showing them a beautiful idea. It's, uh, I call these math fun facts, uh, and um, it's a five-minute digression, often from the, the topic at hand. But it should, it sort of uh, opens up people to a, you know a beautiful idea uh, that causes them to sort of ask, "Oh, why? Or that's kind of cool." Or that, uh, and that's um, I think uh, that's been pretty effective in in helping people sort of get away from the performance side of mathematics. Like, not everything you, you need to learn in math has to be about performance. It can be also about wonder uh, and joy. That's great. That actually leads into uh, another question that Amy in the chat has asked. She says she works with homeschooling families and she often hears from them, why do I need to teach algebra or beyond algebra? Uh, and these are coming from generally very pragmatic mindsets. How would you answer that question? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and this is part of gets, uh, gets at the, the, the question all of us have asked at some point, which is why do I need to learn this stuff? Yeah. And the answer that we often give, we often hear from our teachers is because you'll need to, to know it later. Uh, and uh, part of what I'm saying in the book is that, you know, first of all, that's not necessarily true. Like yeah. n most people learn that who learn calculus never use it, right? Maybe if you uh, do some kind of science engineering, you but um, you know, part of the reason we learn calculus is that it is amazing. It's an amazing triumph of the human mind that we can take a simple idea, the idea that you can cut things up into little pieces and put them back together again, uh, to to and planetary motion or, or you know things that are going on in the world, the dynamics of the world. It's an amazing idea that you can do this. And so part of why we we learn, let's say. I'll come to algebra in just a second. Uh, this is this is like an achievement. It's like you know people going to look at the Mona Lisa or whatever it is you know or Michelangelo. You know, like it's like saying, look, we can appreciate some of the 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 the, the way powerful ways that simple ideas uh, are uh, have had profound consequences on the future of, of humankind. Okay, so that's that's one way to frame calculus, but it's calculus and algebra are both exercises in learning how to think. Right, we all need to to know how to think. So, for instance, uh, when an employer decides they want to hire a math major, they don't hire a math major because they know how to factor a quadratic formula. They hire a math major because a math math mathematically trained person knows how to sit in, in struggle with a problem that doesn't have an easy solution. Right? This is this is what an employer is looking for. Do they have persistence? Do they have curiosity? Do they have all these other virtues that uh, maybe you think of as soft skills, I like to call them virtues, right? Like that, that are built by a mathematical education. So part of why we learn algebra is there is the appreciation side of algebra, which is algebra is basically trying to solve a bunch of problems all at once, right? I don't want to have to, mm. to write that, derive a different formula to calculate how many calories I eat uh, every single time I go to the, the, the refrigerator. No, 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 no. I want one formula that works in a multiple, you know, variety of situations. That's algebra for you, right? That's why mm -hmm. we learn algebra. Um, yeah, I could go on, but I probably shouldn't. No, that's 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 great, and it, it reminds me again of, of sort of a similar conversation in history um, about sort of why major in history, and I, I think humanities tend to get this question even more than um, than other parts of the university, but um, some of the same factors come down, which is that being a historian trains you to think in a certain way and trains you to ask certain types of questions and to weigh evidence and to learn how to weigh evidence. And, um, and it's not, you know, no one will probably ever hire you because you know a lot about the Napoleonic era or something like that, unless you're trying to be a professor in history. Um, but th there are these, and, and, you know, writing skills and other things that a history major, um, gives you. And I think that's a lot of what, um, that can maybe be a misnomer for a lot of people outside of a university is actually what's going on in classrooms isn't, I mean, there is of course a conveying of, of information, but it's, it, that's, you know, you can do that, uh, sitting at home on a computer. What, what's really happening in the classroom often is learning how to think and learning how to struggle another one of your terms, uh, toward, uh, deeper insight. Um, and so I think that's something a lot of field share and, and you'd have to make sort of the same case to the skeptical homeschool parent or the skeptical, uh, 
undergrad student uh, for why they, they should be taking these courses. Yeah, I, I actually uh, um, uh, recently had a, a, an appreciation of thinking uh, using the, the uh, thinking history historically uh, in, in, in terms of what you were describing, because I've been on this task force to try to understand the history of racial discrimination in mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the questions that we had to ponder uh, in our task force as we gathered various kinds of evidence is um, what kinds of evidence uh, are available to us and why are they available to us and what's, right. what evidence is perhaps missing uh, and inaccessible and what and uh, thinking through some of those issues and then that was sort of a, an eye-opening experience for me like aha really you know to think historically you have to learn how to weigh evidence and what's good evidence and what's not. Yeah, it, of course. And, and to get back to the exploration theme, um, there's also, you know, there, there's written evidence, which is the most common type of historical evidence. Um, you know, someone wrote something down or there's a report or something. Um, there's, a, there's an archive with a bunch of papers in it. But there are, of course, other types of evidence that historians, particularly if you get creative, can, can use to weigh in and, and try to find things um, uh, that, uh, so th that, that aren't there in the written record. Um, and so that's, that's a, that there's whole uh, books, there's whole, prof there's whole sort of careers made on, on thinking through creative ways, particularly for people who did not leave archives, um, which, is, which is a lot of people, it turns out, even though there are a ton of archives, uh, most of them were left by you know, the people who could. Um, how do you get at those stories? And, and how, do you, how do you somehow bring those stories into the, to the stories that we have really good records of and documentation with? Um, so yes, it, you just got me going on, on sort of thinking historically, but, um, yeah, yes, uh, no. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So David asks, uh, how can we democratize the use of mathematics in support of the key performance indicators of a just society? So what are some of the ways, maybe this is part of the, that task force too, but so what are some of the ways that you've been thinking about democratizing, uh, mathematics in order to sort of, ad uh, address injustice? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what uh, the, the questioner was asking about um, the key indicators of just society, but I assume he means in terms of uh, uh, having an equitable society where people have uh, access to mathematics regardless of whether you live in a small town or whether you are in, a, uh, uh, in poverty. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, one of the things, there's, so there's a huge movement in mathematics, especially at the K through 12 levels, um, to uh, try to improve uh, access to uh, to good quality uh, mathematics education, um, a lot of people are thinking about it. It's a hard problem to solve um, uh, because you know we when you're a teacher, you know you often are um, you're called on to do lots of things that are that are very hard, uh, and so and you're not too well for it. Uh, and uh, there's also a lot of um, inertia that's um, present in uh, the educational system itself, uh, in um, people wanting to teach uh, the ways that, that, that they, they've been learning mathematics, which is not always um, uh, equitable either. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I guess uh, the question was how, uh, how can you do more of that? I guess um, one thing I would say is to try to tap into what's already being done. Um, people are thinking about what does it mean to teach math in a way that uh, is actually inclusive uh, and recognizes the, the challenges and barriers that some people face, uh, especially if you come from an underrepresented, historically underrepresented background. Uh, so there's a lot of good thinking about how you teach and uh, teach well uh, um, to all students rather than just teaching. You know, the traditional model is uh, uh, teacher talks and students take notes and listen. Mm -hmm. And you know, in college, that's certainly the way the model is. Uh, and the lower grades, it's, you know, drill, uh, drill uh, your math facts, right? Uh, but you know, a lot of the, these practices, are, they're actually cultural practices uh, that are not as welcoming to, um, to people who, um, uh, for instance, don't necessarily um, uh, uh, experience uh, the, some of the, 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 the freedoms of mathematics, right? Like, we, we know that great teachers actually have uh, classrooms where students actually feel like they're participating in mathematics and learning mathematics yeah. uh, and enjoying it, you know, actually making creative choices. Uh, but we also know that in other classrooms, uh, 
uh, mathematics feels like a prison, right? Feel, mathematics feels like you are just um, forcing me to do a bunch of things that I don't like. Uh, and sometimes inequitably, right? Sometimes teachers inadvertently have uh, biases that they uh, propagate uh, in their classrooms that can be unwelcoming to, to, to others. And so thinking through some of those things is, I think, a huge part of what we need to do uh, moving forward in, in the math community. Uh, but I want to say a lot's being done in the K through 12 level. I wish more were being done uh, at the college level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Nicole asks, what sort of practical skills can a math teacher gain to help sharpen her skills with the various techniques required to teach to the standards? Um, but those techniques are not familiar to what that maybe they were trained in. So if you were to advise sort of how, how can math teachers sort of um, keep updated, I guess, uh, in their field, what would you, what would you say? Well, the first thing I would say to uh, administrators, if, if you, uh, you know, if you are uh, an administrator of any kind, um, is uh, to try to provide professional development funds to allow teachers to, uh, to go to conferences or to, to, um, to learn some of the, uh, the to, to get retrained in some of the more uh, inclusive ways of teaching and some of the, the new uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, the standards. Uh, and uh, that, of course, just takes, that takes resources. Um, but, you know, on a personal level, if you're one of these teachers, I would say um, uh, there's a lot of resources that are now available online uh, by following uh, certain, you know, uh, YouTube channels or, or Twitter accounts. There's actually a very uh, uh, friendly community uh, online where you can learn a lot of uh, cool ideas. And I would say push yourself in some ways to to watch videos that may at first make sense. In fact, this is this is what you get used used to doing in mathematics. Like when I watch a math video, there's a lot of that I don't necessarily understand. But part of what I'm doing is sort of making those connections. Mm -hmm. In that ways, it's like learning a new language, like listening. Uh, um, that you do, you can latch on to, uh, and it may help you sort of get a sense of what are the big questions that, that sort of motivate people to think it uh, mathematically, uh, and how can you bring those in. That's what I, I probably would encourage people to do. Puzzle books are another way to um, begin to to think uh, about uh, math uh, and, um, and bringing that in to wonder and joy in as well. Great. Okay, uh, Phoebe asks in the chat, uh, I work at a learning lab where we look at how children understand fractions and the equal sign. A lot of what we think about is if these are intrinsic. What do you think about the idea of innate math skills? So, um, let me turn the question around uh, and ask, uh, what do we think about uh, innate language skills? Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, for instance, a, um, some people are math people and some people aren't. Are we saying, you know, would we say the same thing, like some babies are language people and some babies aren't? <laughs> no, no, no. It learns, picks up, uh, acquires a facility with language uh, uh, in, in a different ways. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I would think this is true that some babies or some people pick up languages faster, uh, but being fast at picking a skill up isn't the same as being proficient uh, and uh, ultimately um, uh, being proficient at it. So, uh, and so coming back to math then, I would say that uh, I, I don't, I, I, I reject the idea that some people are math people and some people aren't. I do think that some people will pick up mathematical ideas, um, have a more of a facility to pick them faster. Uh, but we have plenty of examples in, in mathematics, even uh, of mathematicians who would call themselves slow uh, uh, to pick up things, uh, but have been some of the, the most um, the most um, respected mathematicians uh, in uh, in uh, in history. Even. So uh, yeah, so I, I that's a long way uh, of around of saying of answering the question. Uh, I, I don't subscribe to the idea of uh, innateness uh, as uh, it, it, uh, in mathematics uh, at at the level that we are discussing. You know, which is an appreciation, and understanding of mathematics to to function in society. Uh, it, it, we all can do it. 
Yeah, thank you. So I just want to uh, I want to wrap up here with a few more questions that are uh, more about uh, and they, they're sort of previewing the events we're going to have with you tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, more about your faith and and math and um, and so I'll ask just a few questions here, but also um, uh, point people to both of those events, and I'll I'll talk a little about them at the end of the time here. But you will be with us uh, tomorrow at uh, four p.m. Central, and then on Thursday at noon. Central as well. Uh, but there's a couple questions that have asked sort of about um, the intersection of math and faith. Um, and one of them is by Phoebe. Again, it might be the same Phoebe, I'm not sure, um, who asked the one in the chat, but this is a pre submitted question. And she asks uh, Do we need more mathematicians who believe in God? Is that, and that's sort of a provocative question, but, but is, do you see? Do you see uh, faith impacting math as a field, I uh, guess faith in God as a, in a field? And is that something you'd be interested in, in, in growing, or is that sort of irrelevant to the development of, of math as a field? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, 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 I wouldn't think of math in, in, uh, in those terms, uh, uh, or faith in God in, in those terms. Like I, I mean, I think certainly... Um, if you are a, a person of faith, uh, you can help shape um, um, shape the conversation around uh, some of the, 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 you can contribute to, to the flourishing of, of, uh, of uh, the field of mathematics. Um, you can be salt and light uh, in that sense. Um, you can um, uh, work towards a common good. Uh, and these are all things that I think that, that for instance, Christians are called to do is to work towards the, the common good of, of uh, to seek the welfare of the city to which we've been called, uh, to put it uh, another way. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't think that, it, I, I don't see that as a call to necessarily say that the, the field of math needs more people who believe in God. Um, I would say that, um, uh, that, that, the, those those people who are people of faith can bring uh, something unique to the conversation. Yeah, that's it's actually um, I, I might have been reading into this question in in the field of history. This has been sort of an ongoing conversation, like a public conversation among some historians and some of the big names, people like George Marsden or Mark Knoll, who are sort of pretty well known historians of 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 religion. So they're they're sort of Christians who are studying the history of religion. Um, and these scholars have taken different positions on this. Uh, George Marsden had a famous book in the 1990s called The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship, where he was calling for Christian, basically a, a type of scholarship that only Christians could do. Um, and, and there were plenty of pushback and plenty of, of debate on both sides on whether that's even a legitimate way of framing uh, what a Christian brings to the table, um, to, to the sort of modern university higher education community. Um, and so it's, yes. it's a live question, but um, it, that's also in oh, a particular yeah, so, field. Yeah. 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 No. Actually, now that now that sparks an, an idea, maybe I have a better understanding of the question. I mean, it is certainly the case that um, th there's a, a resonance between uh, uh, between uh, believers in God and uh, those people who appreciate mathematics, even if people themselves are not people of of any particular religion or uh, even an atheist mathematician would say when they see something beautiful that that's profound right yeah. that it's transcendent in some ways uh, and you're many uh, people who, who practice mathematics are drawn to this transcendence uh this beautiful idea you know i sort of mm -hmm. get at that in the chapter on on permanence as well which mm -hmm. is another way of speaking about eternal eternal truths uh and yeah. so having that appreciation is really uh, in many ways a spiritual um longing uh, whether or not you would call it spiritual or and whether or not you're a person of any particular religious stripe. Uh, and so, um, you know, when a mathematician talks about, you know, the, uh, about infinity, you know, that, that you know, r religious people often talk about God's being infinite as well, right? And so there's a certain consonance there. Uh, and as a person of faith, you know, when, when uh, as a, sorry, a person who does math, when a religious person talks about the infinite infinity of God, in, infinitude of God, 
I, I had a deeper appreciation of what that means because, yeah. you know, I understand how interesting and rich and complex the theory, you know, theories around infinite sets are. Um, and likewise, if I'm a person of faith, then um, when I hear about the theories of infinity or see anything transcendent, um, you know, maybe the only difference between me and an atheist mathematician is that uh, I would point that to, uh, to the, the work of, uh, uh, of an eternal um, creator. Yeah, that actually dovetails with a, um, a question that just came in from Susie. Uh, how do you experience God as you think about math? Do you have any reflections on that? that like, can you even put it into words, I guess? But uh, how do you experience God when you think yeah. about math? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one one uh, uh, rich way is that, it, in some sense, when I see the 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 wonder and the mystery that's brought about when I study mathematics, yeah. uh, I feel like I'm getting a glimpse into um, into God's uh, uh, character uh, in some ways. Uh, in you know, in designing a, a rich and beautiful mathematical world, yeah. uh, and so in some ways, doing work is a form of uh, worship for me in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, it's a question I actually wrestled with and maybe I'll talk more about these in, in, in my next uh, couple of, of uh, events. But uh, in some ways, this is sort of the, the big question that I asked myself. You know, when I came to faith uh, in college, I didn't grow up in a, a Christian household, but I came to faith in college. You know, I sort of faced a, a crisis of, well, okay, uh, am I going to um, continue to move down the mathematical path, or am I going to do uh, what some people might call more, more Christian work, right? Like yeah. um, serving the poor and in uh, in um, uh, in another country or something like that. You know, so yeah. this is uh, certainly a question I wrestled with, and uh, now I think I, I have an appreciation, understanding that that part of uh, the the work that I feel that God has called me to do uh, means. Uh, uh, doing mathematical work, uh, appreciating that, that awe and the wonder uh, as a form of worship, and helping others uh, actually appreciate some of those beauties as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last question here. Um, this is from a different uh, David, I think, from the earlier one. But um, what has helped you most flourish as, a, as an academic who's a Christian? Is there something you could point to um, that it, sort of returning to the title of your book, Human Flourishing? Uh, what has helped you most flourish as a as a scholar and an academic? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I would have to say community of, of people who are um, uh, both academics and also uh, uh, people of faith. Um, I, I think that that was that was a question, right? The question yeah. was as a person, both a Christian and as an academic. That's right. Yeah, yeah. it's helpful. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in my own um, uh, institution, there are people who I uh, often uh, 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 talk to uh, and, and pray, pray together with. Um, I have a good friend who is uh, in another field uh, who I meet regularly to, to, uh, to, to pray over uh, our lives, and that some of those include academic concerns as well. I think that's those have been probably the, the, the most helpful experiences for me. To both flourish as a person who uh, uh, is, is trying to be faithful to um, what God has called me to do, uh, while also um, being, uh, being a good steward of, of, uh, of, the, of the, the gifts and the resources that I've been given. That's great. Well, thank you, Francis. Um, we are coming to a close here, and I do want to um, remind people to pick up the book, if you haven't, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, um, Yale Press from last year. Uh, it's quite affordable for an academic press book. If you go onto Amazon, I, I think it's it's under $30. It might even be uh, closer to 20 Yeah, I think the paperback is like 15 and 15 And it's, the, the paperback came out yeah. recently, right? So it's... it's uh, the paperback yeah. just came out, that's right. Yeah. Just came out, yeah, yeah. So yeah, pick up the book if you haven't. It's a great, um, it's a great read, and it's also a great book to share with people... Um, uh, in other disciplines, uh, if you're if you're a mathematician, I guess it, it, it's not just for mathematicians for sure. Um, and and with that, uh, I I do want to highlight that tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central, uh, we will be returning with Francis uh, to talk about bridging the gap between faith and vocation. That's going to be a Zoom meeting, 
Uh, and so uh, part of the intent there is that there will be a more audience interaction with Francis um, and the ability to, uh, for Francis to actually see some of, some of you all. Um, and then we will be back again on Thursday for um, Francis's final event with, with us with this joint partnership on the enigma of academic success. And that will be uh, Francis talking about um, his own career arc and, and also um, some of the pitfalls that m people might fall into um, when they put too much uh, stock in, in a certain type of professional success and how we can um, find our dignity in other places besides um, our work. So please join us for both of those if those sound interesting to you. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, once again, Francis, for this conversation. Uh, and for Thank Travis you. for partnering on this event. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you both. Thank, thank you both. Uh, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, please visit upperhouse.org or anselmhouse.org. Uh, Is it .org, uh, Travis? .org. Uh, for more on, on Upper House and Anselm House. And uh, until tomorrow, uh, go in peace.